in. There we go. We are live. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in, people. Yes, please come on in. We had some technical difficulties. Yes, approve. Let's see what's going down today. There we go. <laughs> Listen, it, come on in, people. I see 15 people, 19 people. I see the numbers coming up. We are live on the Shrine of Ma'at YouTube, the Shrine of Ma'at Facebook, and Comedic Legacy today. We, we are having a little bit of technical difficulties with our stream yard, so we are live on uh, Shrine of Ma'at Facebook page. So right now I'm looking into the StreamYard camera and right now I'm looking into the Shrine of Ma'at Facebook page camera. My face is like mad big. <laughs> All right. So I need y'all to bear with me. So when you want to see the guest, just switch to Shrine of Ma'at Facebook page. We are live there. And uh, that's where you're going to see our guest, and you're going to be able to see the the uh, a more dynamic conversation. Plus, there's a picture of Malcolm X on the wall behind the head of our guests. Okay, that's right. We got Brother Malcolm back there. Everything is going to be okay because we got Brother Malcolm in the back. So please join us there. I see people who are uh, joining us. Pan Africanism includes helping the Africans to build a better life. I like this. I'm about to put this up here. A better quality of life for all of Africa. So today I have brother Asukile Charles Mitchell. Some of you may, may not know, but he is uh, a very close family member with Dr. Rosalind and, and Leonard Jeffries. And he's actually a gatekeeper. You want to get to them, you got to get through him. <laughs> So he's a he's a great man and a good well, brother. <laughs> it might be, it might run, not be out the way. <laughs> or you might see him get knocked out of the way, right? So anyway, so just join us here on Facebook Live, <laughs> so you can uh, see the actual conversation. All righty. So today's conversation is going to be Pan Africanism pushing Pan-Africanism forward, okay? So uh, what, what we're going to do is let's, let's have um, some definitions on the front end. One of the things that I always find so incredibly ineffective is when people, when people um, have platforms and don't explain what things mean. So the Charles, can, let's start off by you explaining what Pan-Africanism actually means. Essentially prepared the same way we wash it, 
chop it up. Some people chop it up fine. Some people like big chunks of it, and we mix it with some kind of meat. Here, in the old days, we might do pork, but we don't do pork nowadays. We do, if you put meat in there, you put in turkey or something, or one of uh, our, our vegan folks might put some turkey or something, whatever y'all <laughs> into. But we always, we always usually mix up one or two meats in with the greens and cook it down and then get the yamen on it with some, some rice or rice and peas or couscous maybe in, in the islands. I know I had an uh, ex-girlfriend, she was Liberian, and they used to make rice and they used to have a fight for the bottom part. You know, when the rice cooks and the bottom part turns brown, they call that crust. <laughs> so, yeah, they will, they will fight to see who gets the crust. They used to eat that with the kalalu. I mean, with the uh, cassava leaf. Mm -hmm. So we have many of the same practices. You know, the sorrow is how big to get tea. You know, so it's, the, it's the same. And, we, and you know, we have other practices that we adhere to our, ge our general belief that there is a God that, that governs the universe. Right. Our general belief from respect for our elders. Mm -hmm. uh, some people more or less uh, practice the tradition of, you know, you know ancestor worship. Uh, folks that might be into Christianity or um, Islam might might not do it, or they might do it in secret. Because look at, like in the Catholic religion, what they have what they call syncretisms, and so they aligned different things up, you know, that was acceptable in the Catholic tradition with the things that um, are for of African origin. But we but we generally have a bunch of different things, no matter where we are, that we all do in common. These things change, like I said, uh, I have, my dog is like pacing around, looking like, what are you doing? You're not paying me attention. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we generally have things that we all do as African people. So Pan-Africanism is not just talking about those, you know, us having a common origin and root, though. It's us uh, having that connection to the land of Africa, uh, our people, have always seen themselves as Africans. There's only maybe in the last 100 years that we've started to develop this idea that we are somehow different because we're in America versus uh, being directly on the continent. But our people were always striving, even at, you know, in the process of enslavement, to go back home to Africa, to reconnect with Africa. And so uh, Pan-Africanism is this belief that you know we, we have a common blood, a common goal, a common destiny uh, in shades of Garvey. And uh, reconnecting with Africa would be the key to us uh, you know, getting our proper freedom and getting our proper space in the, in the history of humankind. That's a pretty thorough definition of Pan-Africanism. Uh -huh. And so I just want to give a little, some little bullets of what he said. So basically what he's, he mentioned, our past, present, and future, um, our past commonality, where we come from, um, our, our uh, cultural connection to the continent of Africa, the way that we, the things that we did in, you know, in common as an African group throughout the continent before we were kidnapped and brought over um, into you know, various locations in the Americas and in the world, quite frankly. And then what it is that we did while we were enslaved and what it is physically enslaved, because some of us, we still enslaved. And what it is that we're doing now, it might have a different name. It might be a little different in, in you know how it looks or whatever, but for the most part, we still do very African things um, because we are African people. So you know, Pan-Africanism means all of us all around the world, those of us who are displaced and the descendants of those of us who've been displaced, plus those of us who are still on the continent, regardless of the religion that we call, the way that we call God, regardless of our complexion, regardless of our language, um, regardless of our hair texture and features, all of that, we're still African. And the collective destiny of us, or, or I should say our destiny is collective, whether some of y'all wanna know it or not, <laughs> If you're on this watching us, you probably have a better understanding of that. But our destiny is is the same. That you you can't you can't um, escape that uh, group dynamic that we have. So yes, thank you for that definition of Pan Africanism um, and how it applies, you know, to all of us. So what can you can you tell me what does it mean to push Pan Africanism forward? What does that mean? 
So for me, what it means, and I think I would say for all of us, it means uh, that we are now in the 21st century. Uh, some of the initial ideas and concepts that may have been applicable to African peoples, meaning where we need to go in the 20th century, uh, uh, need to be updated. You know, some of the goals, some of the uh, some of the strategies that we use or, or, or are using uh, or need to use uh, need to be updated or have been used and also need to be updated. Some of the things that worked in, you know, in the 20th century in the 1900s, not going to work today. Mm -hmm. And also, one of the things that is uniquely different is the technology. The technology that we have today uh, makes things move a lot faster and, and you, you, um, you don't need as much in terms of financial resources as you once did to do some things. Like for instance, uh, when I was at Brooklyn College, I was a film production major and um, I was going to the film production two class. And so I asked, I was concerned because, you know, I was struggling. I was raising my brother and um, I asked the professor, you know, what approximately what was going to be the cost to do this film. We were required to do like, I, I think it's a 10 to 15 minute film on, I mean, it was, I think it was 15 millimeters, something like that. And he said it was going to be close to $2,000, right? Now, if I was taking film class, everything is digital. Right. You know what I'm saying? I can, I can make a high quality film, um, you know, with that, that same $2,000 that would have just been just for that little rinky dink 15 millimeter film. <laughs> I can make a nice film. I can get a nice camera now. And, and you know, have something at 1080p plus. For, for that $2,000, and then I would still have the camera to be able to make other films. But back then, everything, you know, you had to pay for it. You had to rent the camera because you couldn't afford the camera at all unless you had like a little, unless you got like an 8 millimeter camera or something like that back in the days when people used to uh, uh, do their home uh, home films and stuff for them. Right. Uh, you, you buy a camera now, and... You know, you get yourself a couple of those little cars, the SD cars, and you can go to town. You can make a nice film. You could be the next, next Issa Rae or somebody. Shout out to Issa Rae. I just finished watching Insecure this weekend. That's why she's the first one that came. I have it, so don't, uh, no spoilers, please. Yeah, you can do a whole lot more now. Uh, I, I, won't give you, I, won't, I won't give you any spoilers. It was pretty good, though. Okay. But, uh, I, 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 you know, that, that whole show raised a lot of uh, conversation between men and, you know, men and men talking about Wait, uh, I you know, don't... relationships we have with women, but that's another okay. show. Okay, good. Because, you know, Pan-Africanly speaking, that's Black people show. like to um, tell you what's going to happen next. That's a Pan-African thing, too, but go ahead. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, no I don't do spoilers. Good. I, don't do spoilers. I won't give you any spoilers. But you might cry at the end. I did at the end. <laughs> it's a beautiful ending. Okay. Um, anyway, so yeah, what's going on now? Uh, it, you know, the technology makes things that weren't possible in the, in the 20th century possible for us, and things are moving a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. You know, so it went. You know, when I was a, a young boy, you know, we had black and white TVs that was huge. So floor models, they were like the old stereos. You know that you have to stand on the floor. Now the TV, you can have like a 50, 60 inch TV that you can carry by yourself. You know, as long as you can get your arms around it, you can carry it by yourself because it's so light. Mm -hmm. The technology is enabling us to do things that weren't possible before. So things are moving a lot faster. Uh, and that being said, the technology to put it back in, in terms of thinking Pan-African, mm -hmm. and the technology is built on resources that Africa provides. Yeah. And so everybody else is going to Africa. <laughs> yeah, everybody else is going to Africa for their resources to build their technology, and Africans are getting nothing for the resources, and they're not getting access to the, the training that enables them to create these same things that other people are taking their raw minerals to create. So we have to change that. And that's that's something, I mean, that, you know, it's a holdover from the days of diamonds and gold gold and bauxite. 
right? You know, they're taking, you know, the raw the raw resources are in Africa, but everybody else is taking them and making a fortune, right? Africans can build these things with their own technology and sell them to the world. Right. Right. So this is something that we make we need to think a lot more than you know, there's a difference in the twentieth century. Um, we have a lot of young people in Africa. They say that most of the African population is under age 35. So we really have to contemplate how, making the, those of us that are in our 40s, 50s, and 60s have to contemplate what kind of world are we going to leave young, these young Africans and how are we going to prepare them and where we would prepare. Because I think that's a big issue too, because I think a lot of our people in the 40s, 50s, and 60s weren't prepared for any real leadership. And so we have to figure out how we're going to prepare ourselves for that leadership and prepare the future generations to be able to move Africa and African people into a space where we could be where we could be full human beings, spiritually, mentally, physically. And, you know. And then also full human beings in terms of our place on the human stage with other ethnic groups and races. So races. I, I want to jump in and and. And, and say and say this, I think that, and, and I want to circle back to Africa having the the these young people on the planet, the you know youngest group. I have a comment here on Streamyard, and and I had talked about how you know we came from Africa and we were displaced. This comment from Brandon X says, although some of us did have roots already in the states, Brandon X, I want you to explain that because I've heard this that we were already here. And the here usually means the United States. So what do you mean by that? Because this is something that is also divisive. Because it no, no, I want him to explain it. Because I I have I have what I think it could mean, but when, when people when when people say we were here, I don't ever and I literally have never, zero times have I gotten an explanation of what here means. So I I I have pinned it on StreamYard, and it says, although some of us did have roots already in the States. So Brandon, I want you to explain what that means. We were already here. What does it mean? I've heard this. I've seen people discuss it. I've been on other people's YouTubes when they are, that's their conversation. And I have very specific questions and they've zero times have they been answered. So if there's information that you have to explain that, I'd like to hear it because this is something that is really divisive and it just doesn't seem to be explained or let go of either explain it. I'm not just talking about you, Brandon, at this point, I'm saying this whole movement that we were here already. Now I have my own reason to, 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 to um, maybe support that, but since I didn't make the statement, I'm not going to prove it. Okay, so I'm gonna wait for him to come back into the chat on StreamYard. I don't see it. Wait for him to come back in the chat. I hope he's still here. Um, and then we're gonna keep on moving. And then when he gives an answer, then I'm gonna just circle to answer back because I'm, I'm broadcasting kind of in two places on on, on Facebook, um, Shrine of My Eye page, and then also um, Kemetic Legacy today and the and the and the YouTube page is picking it up. So getting back to our leadership, how are we preparing our young Africans on the continent? And so how are those of us who are displaced Africans doing that? And how is the is there leadership on the continent that's preparing our young Africans to have young, to have African minds and to and to be be placed in a position where the decisions that they're going to make in the future will benefit Africa. Do we? Do you know that? Do you, Do you know if if that's happening that's there? Hard, that's that that is a that, that's that's a hard question to answer. Both hard. It's not so much hard in terms of I can't answer it, but it's hard because while there are clusters of, of Africans that have nurtured young people to to places like the Ujama Shule and uh, Arcobia in, in DC, uh, the East here in, in, in New York, and there are pockets 
of people that have been of young people that have been nurtured in Pan Africanism. But um, overall, for our people, we don't control our culture. Unfortunately, correct. Right, in terms of how it's presented in our in our schools, in terms of how it's presented in the media. So a larger portion of our people are miseducated out of out of self, miseducated out of denying their Af- Africanity, miseducated out of denying their in, you know, into rather denying their blackness itself. Right. Yeah, you know, they want to be everything else. They want to be a Native American, right? They want to be Asian or mixed with Asian or the the, the uh, black man or uh, what, what's the. Uh, Asiatic black, black man, right? Right. The Asiatic daily. That's just, that's what I was trying to think of. Thank you. The Asiatic black man, right? They want to be everything else, but from the African continent. Exactly. Because of how the African continent and its people have been portrayed as as primitive, which primitive only means prime. It means first. So they insult you by telling you you were the first. Right. And that's something. I know. Right. <laughs> right. Say that again. Say that. So, Say, wait, say that one more time. Primitive to being un- uncult. So primitive, primitive, what is the root of primitive? Prime. Prime means first, the, the first one. And so they're telling you what you are every day, you know, insulting you. And you take it as an insult, not realizing that they know that you're the first. And this is exactly why they keep you down, because they know that you're the first. They know that you're the blameless Ethiopian. They know that you brought science and technology and farming and the idea of civilization and nation structure and formation itself to humans because you were the first on the planet Earth. Because you're the first on the planet so Earth. When most of our young people, we were the first on this planet Earth. Now, we might have came from the stars or so. I'm in Nukai or whatever the stuff that people is talking about, right? But we were the first human beings on this earth. We are the first Homo sapiens sapiens, first uh, man, knowing man, knowing. That's what Homo sapiens sapiens means. Sapiens means knowing, right? We are the first. And all the other strains of, of humanity, or and if you believe in evolution, they all, we were the first in those areas, meaning that those. Uh, Homo habilis, which is handyman, Homo erectus, which is man standing up on two legs. All of those strains were first found in Africa, in the heart of Africa. Not, not, you know, not on the peripheries, in the bowels of Africa, in the deep part, the Bantu people, the, the Twa people, the Nubians, and then the, the, uh, the Ethiopians, then the, the Egyptians or the Kemites. Then, of course, we spread up to West Africa and other places, South Africa. We are the first people. All of the first strains of humanity are come through us. And all of the other races come through us. You know, I waved to him with his brothers talking about he's not really talking about America. He's talking about the continent, or what we call North America and South America, that we were here first. And we were here first because Africa is dispersed throughout the world. So I'm going to jump in and say this. I'm going to jump in and say this. African people walked around this planet first. So yes, African people were on the planet, for, were on the planet first and, they, and walked around first. And we were in the Americas first, North America, Central America, Central America, and South America first. So yes, that statement is correct. However, the, the movement is, they, what they are saying is we are here first and that's it. So my question has always been twofold because I don't see an answer from him. My question has always been twofold. Are you acknowledging that we walked around? What'd you say? He's not going to be able to answer because many of our people are moving off of emotion. That's right. People, people are, hold on, Charles, I'm going to say this. People are moving on emotion and without facts. When I ask the question, one of two possibilities is the answer. And this is what I say. Are you saying that we, 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 we came from Africa and we migrated all around the world, which there is evidence and proof of? Or are you saying that the very first human beings started in, on the, in North America 
and you have proof of that. And then if you're saying that, are you saying it did not start in Africa? Like, what are you saying? So my point is the we were in America first movement only just says we were here first. And then when I ask the question through right. migration or through, you know, being the through or, or evolution, if you will, you know, being the first people again, then what about all this evidence that shows that we were on the continent African and that's where we started? That's where life started. Are you saying life started in Africa and life started in the Americas with no connection? Or are you saying we migrated? So, so I, I think it's important that as, as African people and Pan-African people that we look at evidence with an objective eye and we scrutinize. It's, it's important to do that because we have to make sure that we have the facts. But a statement with, no, with zero follow-up zero okay and with a and with a statement with no proof that does not push pan-africanism forward it doesn't bring us together we have to say oh i don't know this or oh this is my proof or that is outdated or this is something new but whatever it is there needs to be some sort of proof that we can all objectively scrutinize not to diss anyone or put anyone down or anything like that, but to make sure that we have evidence and, and, and you know a scientific foundation on what it is that we're talking about and what we're doing so that we don't spend our time discussing things that are based in no facts or it's a statement with nothing to follow up from that. So I see other people in here who are answering the question. I didn't ask anybody else to answer the question, quite frankly, because, because my point is, if you make a statement, you should be the person who can prove it. And as, and as, and as we push Pan-Africanism forward, we have to be able, one last point, and I'm gonna give you the back the mic. When we make, when we make statements, we have to be able to prove them. And we also have to be able to say we don't know or we're wrong or whatever, myself included. Yes, um, Brother Charles. Well, I was going to ask you to read, to read what are some of the things that people are saying. So I, I want to see, I want to, I can't see what you're looking at. So I wanted to. Uh, um, they're, they're going by fast. Somebody told me to read a book. I'm not reading the book because the point was the person who made the statement should be able to prove what they're saying. I'm not reading the book. The, the point wasn't, is it a, is it a fact? The, the point was the person who makes the statement needs to prove the fact, needs to prove their statement. I'm not reading that book. I have no reason to read the book because there's nothing for me to research. When you make a statement, where did you get this information from and cite your source? You have a conversation, you cite the source. People will then say, well, you're being lazy because you don't want to do the research. No, you are supposed to, when you make a statement, you say, I read this here. There's commentary that happens. You answer questions. And then after that, if someone is more interested in that topic, then you read this book. It isn't you make a statement and then the other person has to read the book to prove your point or to, or to even find some kind of corroborating evidence for your statement. So, so someone said... Someone said, um, read, read the works of Dr. David M. Hotep about Africans in the Americas. No, that is not the, 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 yes, the, the right now, this book might, this book might say something about Africans in the Americas, but the person who made the statement didn't even really explain, is it from migration? Is it, is it from evolution? I, my point is this, and I really want to get off this point. When you make a statement, it is okay and it's welcome to, to look at things from a new angle, to bring in new information, to have um, your own opinion, but it has to be based in something and it's your responsibility to cite your source. Like if you said, we were here already, Dr. Ivan Von Sertema's, well, you know what I'm saying? Um, um, they came before Columbus. Okay, so what you're saying is basically we migrated is the point, but the, but the guy didn't say that. So, so what I'm saying is say what you have to say, please, by all means, but it has to come from some source that you must cite. That's, that's, that's my point. 
and I and 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 I and I brought that point out because it th this is a this is a new way to have division amongst us. We don't need any more division. We there are plenty that are imposed on us, and we've been taught how to be divisive. Okay, through this Western culture, we've been taught how to be divisive, so we don't need to add new divisions. So, you know, I, maybe I'm belaboring this point, but when you make a statement, be able to prove it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's up to, I, I, I get you. It's, it's up to you if you make a statement to be able to prove That's it. right. Prove what you're saying. It's not up to us as a listener to prove your point. You're supposed to prove your own point. Exactly. What you say. But to David Imhotep, to the question of David Imhotep, and others, Clyde Winters, and then there's uh, late researchers like Dane Calloway and others. They say that we were here before the formation of America. And we were here before the formation of America. You know, uh, David Imhotep and his books can go back at least two or 300,000 years of, of, of people that look like you and I, especially here in America, and even actually even darker. But... When we look at the historical human record, Lucy, a.k.a. Dinkanesh, was found in Africa, and if I'm not mistaken, the old Duvai Gorge, and her bones have been dated back to, I think it's 3.2 million. Not, not 300,000, not 200,000, 3.2 million years ago. And she's a black woman. Period. Right, black people, black people who have been on this earth as the first people for not a few, not a few hundred years, not a few thousand years, not a few hundred thousand years, for millions of years. And so to argue to say with some black folks that uh, whether they walked into the America through a, a Pangea or whether they uh, emerged in America. Uh, maybe, they, you know, however humans emerge from amoebas or whatever prior uh, uh, species existed, they can only go back two or 300,000 years here in America. Human beings were on the African continent millions of years before that. And so whether we migrated here or emerged here, like life emerged in uh, Africa, uh, or whether we came later on as, as the expeditions of uh, people, they say the brother of Masa Musa uh, made an expedition to the West and disappeared. Uh, they say that the, the uh, Ethiopian, not the Ethiopians, excuse me, the, the, the Egyptians, the Kemites, uh, were able to sail across the world. And uh, Thor Heyerdahl had a Kontiki uh, expedition where he tried to build boats using the same methods as the uh, Egyptians. Uh, as to see if they were really, uh, you know, seaworthy for long expeditions and not just going up and down the Nile River. And he was able to. So however we got here, we, we, we were here before the founding of America, before the Spanish and the Portuguese uh, discovered that the world wasn't flat, before they started bringing Africans here in the, in the enslavement process. We were here first. Yes. Right? So we need to make that clear. But people right. use that to say that we are not the same as the Africans right. on the, from the continent. But we are. But we are. And even if we were if, even if there was a whole group here that was separate from the Africans, during the process of colonization, my white folks, the indigenous folks here and the Africans intermixed. The relationships were good, the relationships were bad. We had good relationships where we had the Seminole Wars fighting against the oppression of Europeans. We had bad relationships with some Indians owned, uh, owned Africans as slaves. Right? We have to be honest about the whole mix. But, you know, human relationships, even our own families, modern day families, we don't always have the greatest of relations. I have people that I know that are friends and family that say that their real family is their friends. You know, the, the, the relationship that they've cultivated with their friends because of all the trauma and things in their family, they can't get along with their family. That's part of human 
that's part of the, the you know human experience. Our existence as human beings. We're going to have trials and tribulations, and unfortunately, especially in the situation that we are in currently as African people, not controlling our land, not controlling our labor, not controlling our resources, not controlling as Dr. Jeffries would tell us the economic, politics, and culture and uh, the system that we're in. So we have to work as African people to have to get control of the land of our fathers and mothers, right? Because that land is the key to us having a different future for ourselves. That land is the key for us to be able to pass something down to our uh, children, our sons, our daughters, our nieces, our nephews, our little cousins. That land will be the key for us in our freedom because not just the land, the people in the land That's can right. bring us back into our wholeness as human beings, right? And I'm, what I'm talking about now with spirit, Dr. Jeffries always, when he talks about economics, politics, and culture, and pyramid analysis, and systems analysis, and all that, in the heart of it all is a little circle, in the middle, like he draws a, a circle, and there's a pyramid, and with thesis, antithesis, synthesis, or economic, politics, culture, or... Um, uh, what is it, sociology, psychology, and I forgot what the other one, ecology, or something like that. I forget. I'm going to tell one. him. I'm going to tell him you forgot. Go ahead. In the center of that is another circle. In the center of that is another circle. Core spiritual values. Our spiritual values as African people determine what our politics, what our economics, and what our culture is going to look like. That's right. It determines whether or not. Charles. The, uh, Charles. I'm Charles. Charles, I'm going to jump in really quick. I want to close one topic down. Brother Charles referenced Dan Calloway to say that he was not a good historian. So, yeah, with Mr. Untouchable, when you said Dan Calloway is not a historian, bro, that's what Brother Charles said. I don't know if you heard all of it. He he wasn't saying that he was a historian. I said, I said he, let, me, let me be clear because I'm not on here to beat up. Anybody. I didn't say he wasn't, wasn't a good historian. I said he was a laid researcher. And I said before, let's go back. I, I, Did uh, you say I lame or that. laid? I didn't say uh, laid, L-A-Y, laid. Lay. Lay. He's not professionally trained. Not but professionally trained. Laid. I don't know what they can hear. Also. I don't know what they can hear here, but he said that he is um, not, he's not professionally trained. He's a, he's a lay researcher. I don't want to belabor that point because that's not what this one is. But it's about pushing Pan Africanism forward. And I mentioned, and I mentioned the um, the we we were here first comment because it's divisive, and and the the divisiveness in it is um, not pushing Pan Africanism forward. And we have to be better at doing research when we make our points. That's why I spent the time on it that I spent on it because. It's going to take our collective work to get this done, which means we're going to have a lot of conversations coming from different perspectives. We're going to have to prove it and, and take what's provable and, and unite and move forward. OK. And so what Brother Charles is saying right now is um, who me? You, you can't hear what I'm saying. Um, let me, I can turn everything up. I, I do can, but you sound very low. I don't know what happened. You were, you were fine I was before. fine before. Really okay. Low. Well, I, okay. Um, so, um, and also I, I can't respond to all the comments. So if some people don't get responses, it's not because I'm like picking on you or ignoring you, especially today when I'm looking at two, two cameras. Okay. Okay. So brother Charles, what what the last thing you were saying was after we have this we have the land okay and we're going to be you know working in our uh economics politics and culture and spirituality is right in the middle of that um and so that is something that we need to have because we need to be able to um have our minds where it needs to be okay and the spiritual component to it is what guides the mind. One of the things that uh, my yoga teacher would say, or the yoga teacher would say when I would do Bikram Yoga in, at Bikram Yoga Harlem, which no longer exists, where the mind goes, the body will follow. 
So if your mind is centered around junk food and fast food and the pleasure of right now and you know no no long-term plan for health that's where your mind is if you see like the local dive food place that's not really healthy if if you see um you know fast food or something along those lines or um just something that's you know roadside food you're going to eat it because your your mind is centered around something that's not healthy and so your body follows your mind and so what i was saying charles is what you were saying you know you've got the the economics the culture the politics and in the middle you have the spirituality and what i was saying is the mind is what controls the body and 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 it manifests itself in um, our spirituality and how we live as spiritual beings in a physical body. So Charles, that's where you left off. Why don't you go ahead and bring us back to some of Dr. J's words with um, economics, politics, and culture. Um, Cause even, even though he ain't saying it, it's still cool that it's coming from Dr. J, go ahead. So, all right, so spirit, our spiritual beliefs, our thoughts on how we interact with the universe. And, you know, there's a whole, whole lot of fancy words, oncology, epistemology, and all these other ologies that I could throw out there to show that I've been a student of Dr. Jeffries, but <laughs> I'm not going to use all of that. But the African people have a, a way that we look at the universe that, that is uniquely ours, uh, the way, a way that we look at the earth and our place on the earth, a way that we look at energy, the way that we look at our relation to other non-human beings, like you know, the different animal forms, the different plant forms, uh, mineral life itself. You know, Bob Baba and Fudishi talk a lot about you know the different forms of the plants, minerals, right. uh, animal, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a unique perspective, and that we are not better or worse. Than any of these beings, they all have. If you follow, uh, if you follow Yoruba uh, belief, we, we all have our shape. Everything has the life, the energy of life within it, and therefore must be respected as such. Everything is of God because it is complete. <laughs> Everything belongs to God and is of God and is part of God. That is a unique perspective in in. in the life of humanity that perhaps we that we only have that other beings don't have. We have a we have for instance a a idea called Ubuntu. I am because you are. That's right. And you are because I am. Well, I am because we are, but we are because I am. Which says to us that the individual is important. And the group is important, but neither is more important, and neither can exist without the other. Right? Uh, Doc, uh, Dr. Edward Nichols, who's an organizational psychologist, breaks down, you know, the, the great thoughts of the each uh, quote unquote race. Uh, white folks say, "I think that for I am very independent, very self-centered, very you know, I exist." Uh, in competition with you, you know, I exist because of my free will, or as Americans say, because I pull myself up by my bootstraps, which is false because there's no, nobody really that pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. Everybody that has uh, proceeded in life proceeded because somebody gave them a hand, whether they helped them to get to school, whether they helped to give them some money to, to invest whatever that project was, there's nobody that really has, has existed without the help of another human being. Now, the Asians, the Asians say, I exist. Uh, what is the Asian? The Asian is, uh, I'm, I'm, I can't think of the exact way I want to say, but the Asian thing is basically that I exist for the group. The group is more important than the individual. So in the Asian mindset, for, for example, in China, you can say that the, the future of China is more important than any individual families. You could 
killed all of the girl baby fetuses because you need billions of Chinese men to make the new China, right? But Mother Nature, the African Mother Nature had a different trick for the Chinese. Now that China has all these men and no suitable women to mate with them, they have surplus people. And so the same problem that we have with Chinese, all those people that are from China that are in Africa are these single men that they that they uh, nurture to the exclusion of Chinese young, uh, females. So they, they have nobody to mate with, that most of them are undereducated. And so the women that are available are now a high commodity in China. I recall uh, seeing the documentary where, you know, the Chinese, like many people, you know, including Africans, have a culture of, you know, matchmaking. And so they had this, they had this park and it wasn't Hong Kong, I forgot what, but, you know, Hong Kong is an island anyway. But there's somewhere in mainland China, there was a particular park, this documentary was taking place, and the young ladies were going there with their parents, and young men, you know, potential suitors were coming. And because they, there were so few girls now, the girls could say, well, I want a man that was, you know, is college educated. I want a man, you know, that has this amount of money. And so all these poor, dumb, Joe Schmo Chinese brothers, now they can't, <laughs> now they're, they're not considered uh, marriage material. So now, uh, now they have to go somewhere else to find wives. And many of them are coming into Africa. And what's the danger for that for us? And we will probably talk about this more as we, we uh, proceed. As many of these dudes have realized that the land in, in particular places like in Ghana, for instance, the land is uh, inheritance of the land is, is through the female. And so these Chinese men are coming in and getting in our culture and marrying African women. We're letting them and in. Therefore, that's going to give them. That's giving them what their descent. We could talk about that, that too. Give them or their descendants the a direct claim on African land. And so, yeah, to, to the point that we're letting them in. Well, when you. Uh, Marcus Garvey said something I think is very, very key. A man without confidence in self is twice defeated in the race of life. African people, because we have. We have been miseducated out of stuff to see ourselves as inferior and unsophisticated and unprimitive. We look at everybody else as people that can do and look at ourselves as people that can't do, right? Because we don't know our history. We don't know the deep values that come out of our traditions or even if, even those on the continent that have the tradition don't fully appreciate the tradition. Right. Right. You know, they look to Christianity or Islam or some other thing as the way forward. They look at the tradition as, oh, that's the old way they do. You know, that's the old way of doing things. And because uh, they uh, don't understand it, because they don't want to be held accountable, which is really a big, big problem we need to talk about. People don't want to be held accountable right. to the community. Yep. Uh, they look to other people to for solutions to our problems. Nobody can solve our problems but us. Period. Nobody else can heal our families or pick our families whole but us. You know, nobody else can bring Africa forward for African people but us. So we're going to have to learn, I guess, the hard way that all these Chinese and all these French people and all these English and all these uh, uh, Indians and other folks coming so. into Africa. Pick so. not coming into Africa for African people. Right. They're coming in for their benefit to take the resources, just like they do here in the hood. They come in the hood and build their stores, and at night they go back to their neighborhoods with the resources and the wealth that they've acquired. They do not build up anything in the hood, and they're not going to build up anything in Africa for African people. As they build it up, they're building it up with the intent to come in there and replace the African people. Yep. Or uh, or become new colonial masters of African yep. people. Period. And you know, my question is this: I, you know, <laughs> I don't understand how. And I, well, I do understand. It doesn't make any sense that we have literally hundreds of years of this happening, and people who live in the actual moment, okay. Uh, for some reason, think that the same thing happening is going to is going to yield a different result. 
they, if for some reason they think that what is actually happening right in front of them is not what's happened historically. So at what point, even if you believe in Abrahamic religion, even if even if you like don't know any of the old ways, do you not know any history whatsoever? Even even the European version of the history says they came here, took the land, and gave you Christianity. I mean, that's not a secret on the planet. I mean, and so I just it just I don't understand how people wait, wait, can. Wait, 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 wait. Pause, pause for one second. Pause for one second because that's not true. Okay. The fundamental, the, the, the fundamental belief of Christianity when Africa first, before the European world. Now the European has created this version that he controlled, that emanates from. See, see, in the early, early Christianity, and when it started forming, forming to organizations, right? There's the Holy Roman Orthodox Church, which is Catholicism. Mm -hmm. There's the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, which is, you know, Ethiopia, you know, Lalibela, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Lalibela comes later, but, you know, it's that the, the Ethiopians had their own brand of Christianity, where the angels look like the Ethiopians. Right. Uh, the, the, the Christ figure looks like the Ethiopians, and any of the saints or whatever look like the Ethiopians. Right. Right, the European created this thing of the, with the Holy Roman Orthodox Church, and then later with Protestantism and its different strains, Anglicanism, Ang, uh, Anglicanism, Protestantism, and uh, so forth, coming out of the Protestant Reformation. They control uh, how, you know, because they they control, and then the way that they think about life itself control how they shape Christianity. But then, and then there's the Greek Orthodox Church, which is, which is entirely different from the Holy Roman Orthodox Church. They practice way different. The Greeks being people that are more in line, I would say more in line with African because it's actually the Greeks are more of a mixed people, and they were closer to the to uh, Africa and uh, I call it East Africa. Some people might call it the Middle East, <laughs> but. Um, you know, the way that they practice is different than, than what, you know, what came out of Protestantism but before that Catholicism. See, but that, that Catholicism is the, the Roman Empire trying to control the beliefs of the pagans so that they could control the pagans. And so, but it's the beliefs, the beliefs are African people's beliefs. You know, Haru, and I saw it, I said, no, that's the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I'm not. I'm not sure what you're saying. That's different than what I said, though. I'm what. I'm not sure what you're saying is. I don't. I agree with all of this. This is all right. Because what you said is they they gave us Christianity. They did not give us. So let me. Okay, let me clarify, Charles. Let me let me clarify that you're correct in that. Let me let me be. Let me say it better because you're right. Let me say it better. The Christianity that they gave us, the version that they gave us. Is the version that okay. that brainwashed us and um, and took our land? Hold on, my dog is acting crazy. What do you want, dog? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> this is the craziest Tuesday talk I've ever done ever. <laughs> no, come on. Oh my goodness. I'm... <laughs> okay, so Charles is correct. I I did not say it. The best way to say it, the
one of my student leaders, uh, she was actually, she was actually, you know, raised here in America, but she was actually uh, of direct African descent coming from, I think it was, uh, I think it was Ghana and Senegal where her, her parents were from. Uh, so I was talking to her about applying to some of the HBCUs. And she said, Mr. Mitchell, I don't want to tell you, you know, I had to do the, do the, you know, with the girls. Mr. Mitchell, I don't want to talk about no HBCUs. I want to talk about that black stuff. I'm going to a white school because white people run everything and white people do this and that. And I did, yeah, you see the neck roll and everything. I'm getting in the character. <laughs> but, um, see, you know, our children have looked at this reality and realized that this reality does not reflect us in right. a positive way. So they want to be everything but us in, in many aspects, uh, either subconsciously or consciously. They want to be the other. And it's, but it starts with how we nurture them. It starts with, you know, how we talk about God, you know, the godliness that is in us as each, as being human beings. You know, we are all the children of God, not just, the, not just black people, not Asians. Our Asians don't have no special claim on it. White folks don't have no special claim on it. Uh, Africans don't have a special claim on it. We all are spiritual beings. We all are part of the creator. That's that going back to that Ashe. Ashe is in everything and everyone, whether we like it or not. Right? So we have to expect, respect that energy, that God energy. We have to figure out where it's going with white people. What's the purpose of white people on this planet now? Uh, but uh, we, we still have to respect it and honor it as life. And I think that's part of our problem. You know, it may be unconsciously part of our problem as Africans dealing with Christianity and white folks. Because we somehow uh, seem to be expecting them to, to be good. And when historically, time and time again, it's shown us that that as a collective culturally they cannot be good you know to to us to the earth it's destructive to the animals it's destructive yeah. it's 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 the, the a general species left and right just generally it's destructive and then there are various maybe forms of it purpose. i'm sorry maybe, maybe that's the purpose maybe they are uh maybe they are chaos on earth i don't it's know that, maybe they are chaos to our my eye Right, that's right. It's fat. Maybe that is fat to our mind on on this earth. Maybe that is their purpose because destruction is not necessarily a bad thing in, in some cases. Because if, if there was no death, there could be no life. Life comes out of life and reemerges. A new life reemerges out of death. So maybe that's their function. But maybe they're just so whack, you know, so out of balance in that function and because we're out of balance as the ma'at that's supposed to be the balance you know the, the yin to that yang you know what i'm saying i don't know i don't know but we white culture has shown that it cannot move african people forward and for us to continue to expect white folks to speak move on forward it with african people is, is foolish it's just foolish you said it better than me i think that's that's what i was trying to say you see what history has shown so what in the world are you looking for that's true. What you just said, it, we we see <laughs> that that's not going to push um, African people forward. So it doesn't make it doesn't make cognitive sense. What what your own eyes see, and even in the whitewashed version of history, even if you believe that one hundred percent, the fact that it doesn't push African people forward, or brown skinned people, whatever, however you want to classify yourself. It's, why is that still your motive of operation? How is that working out for you? Yeah. <laughs> well, like like I said, um, Wade Nobles defined power, and then this, uh, this, and some years ago, the Sons of Africa, we came up with a modified. It's very, it's still, it's pretty much the same, but we tweaked it a little bit. We said power is the ability to define reality and have others respond to that definition as if it were your own. So white folks have mastered that ability to define reality, right? And have us respond to it as if it were our own. They've convinced us that uh, human beings, uh, human beings, it's okay for human beings to, uh, uh, of male and female, for males to interact with males, 
for females to interact with females sexually and, and create family. But science tells us that that is not the case. Science tells us that it requires, at least in the human species, that it requires one male and one female to make offspring. Hennessy tells us that. White folks, and this science will have you believe. <laughs> I'll say it again. I said Hennessy tells us that. We don't need no science textbook for that one. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, you funny. <laughs> Yeah, I guess Hennessy did does tell us that so child we can get that little drinky drink on. <laughs> but yeah, there's no other way to produce human life. I don't care. You know, they're they're working on things now so to, to implant wounds into men, you know, so they so they have these sex they have sex changes now where men can get breasts or, or implant fake breasts. Uh they can chop off the junk and you know and and, and take the, the, I guess they take the, the scrotum and the, or the sack from the scrotum and, and make some kind of folk uh, labia and so forth. And you can make something that looks like something that don't mean that it is something. Yeah, you know, that's... They, they still... Stop, let them stop taking those hormones. Let them stop taking those hormones and all that stuff, that, uh, except for what is artificial, like the, the silicon thing, all that stuff will go back to its natural, revert back to its mother penis can, because you chopped it off. But <laughs> all, of, all of the inside stuff that they artificially changed is going to revert right back to it, this normal self. So, and this is, this is again, going back to what is the difference between how African people view the world versus how white people or European civilization views the world european civilization views the world as if it is something to conquer yeah as if it is the enemy to bet right african science works in harmony with the environment right african science allowed us to build pyramids and tekanu or obelisks right and white folks are still trying to figure out how we did it because they can't take they can't take, for instance, with the obelisk, they can't take a piece of stone, they can't quarry a piece of stone one quarter of the size of the, 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 the ones that our ancestors built and move it and stand it up without breaking it. You know, they have documentary up on PBS about that, them trying to figure out the engineering of the ancients, meaning our people. They, they won't say Africans, they'll say the ancients. Right, say the, right. The Egyptians with them in mind trying to disconnect Egypt from the rest of Africa but they can't, they've been trying to move this this uh, a small small like a quarter of the size of a normal, you know, of the biggest obelisk and move it and stand it up without cracking it and they can't figure out how to do it they can't figure out how the ancients moved these granite uh, blocks to create the pyramids the you know, the great pyramids of, of, of Kemet they can't figure out how to do it because everything in their mind is is it that we exist in opposition to nature or separate to from it, right? So they can create right separate from it, right? So they can create science that is detrimental to Af to to existence. African people were building homes, uh, you know, living structures, administrative structures for thousands of years before there was a white person. I remember I, one of the first things I learned when I started um, learning under Dr. J, Dr. Jeffries at uh, the City College folks, uh, Dr. Clark was still alive. And Dr. Clark also always referred us to uh, Palmer and Colton's History of the Modern World. And in the, I forgot whether it was the pre, pre it, 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 this is the beginning of the book, I'm not sure if it's the introduction or the preface, but and in that preface, Palmer and Colton say that, talk about why Africans on the African continent, all these wonderful things were going, going on. At the same time those things were going on, there was nothing more exciting going on in Europe in terms of creation, in terms of architecture, than the building of, not building, but the creation of kitchen middens, M-I-D-D-E-N-S. What are kitchen mid middens? Kitchen middens are huge heaps of garbage. So while Africa was creating all of this sustainable design and working in harmony with nature, white folks were creating huge garbage heaps in, 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 in Europe 
uh, during the, uh, I would say this is like the dark ages or the period just before the dark ages. He says, Parliament Carl said that there was, Europe was known for nothing more than its kitchen business at the time the Africans were doing all these great things. Mm. And we still have the problem of kitchen middens today. Your America creating all of this garbage by creating clothes, 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 so much clothes that they ship it to Haiti, that they ship it to Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, and all these places. And, and it, you know, it's actually creating a problem for African people what to do with all of these quote unquote donated clothes, you know, that that's really America's garbage, mm. right? And that's just clothes. That's not even talking about the other things like the computers, the, the light bulbs. Uh, the home furnishings, the cars. America created huge piles of garbage for the world to deal with, and it's toxifying the earth. Whereas if we had an African, if we would claim an African mindset and looked at how to create things, Africans don't create anything that is detrimental. Traditionally, don't create things that are detrimental to nature. The, the things that we built, like people look at the clay you know, the clay huts and things like that and look at them as unsophisticated. But these things will go back into the earth, won't they? Most folks don't think about that. We could have built a whole lot. Of, we could have built, we had glass. We could have built all this, you know, we we had glass, we had pottery, we had uh, iron and, and metal working and iron, you know, iron smelting. We could, we could have created all the skyscrapers and all of these things. Now, it's obvious with the Tekkens and others that we knew how to build high yep. structures yep. that were stable. So if we wanted to build all of that, we could have. But if we built all of that stuff with glass and all these things that don't biodegrade easily, then it would be garbage left for the next generation. You know what? Will. Every And we don't do that culturally. Every garbage day, I think about this, like literally. Every time there is garbage day, when the garbage guys come and take it and bring it just to pile up, just to pile up, I think about that. And I remember in eighth grade, our, I think it was eighth grade, the science teacher said, styrofoam cannot be destroyed. You can't burn it. You can't get rid of it. And I remember thinking that can't be possible. How can something that comes from the earth not be able to be recycled back to the earth? I remember thinking that. Go back and get to the earth. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so this is before I have ever heard the word Kemet. This is this was when I still thought Jesus existed, literally. But I had African-centered parents, and their from their behavior, I guess an, enough of that seeped into my psyche. And so um I remember watching some styrofoam burn, but not get totally consumed. And I'm like, how is it that fire can't consume this? It would seem to me like fire can consume everything. And so, you know, th and throughout my life, when I would see styrofoam containers, I'm like, this thing is never leaving the earth. Like, where is this going? It just doesn't go away just because, you know, trash day gets here. It's just moved from your house to someplace else, but it's still here. And so when thousands and thousands of years from now, when the Tamahu is no longer on this planet, is the styrofoam going to still be here? Are we going to be able to go revert back to our African-centered ways so that we, we're going to be able to, um, so that we're going to be able to get this stuff off the planet? Or are we just going to always have that indelible mark on the planet? See, well, that is, and, and going back to moving Pan-Africanism forward, that's one of the things that I want African people to think about in terms of the challenges of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. How can we use our way of thinking to solve some of these problems? Is there a way that we could recombine this? I want to I, I write a book on this, that thinking, thinking differently about technology, thinking differently about the way that we use technology, thinking in harmony with nature instead of in competition or in opposition to nature. Is there some way that we can recombine styrofoam and all these other uh, uh, petroleum uh, derivatives, you know, acrylics, rayon, uh, oil, etc.? Is, is there some way that we can recombine these with other, um, other, not, 
other molecules or other other not atoms. What is the word? Uh, periodic table. What am I? Elements. Uh, is there some way that we can recombine elements? Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> is there some way that we can co recombine these with uh, you know, the elements and these things with other elements to render them inert, where they can come back, go back into the earth? That's right. This is one of the challenges that we can think about, right? And as we build this technology, you know, with the, with its primary uh, mineral resources coming out of Africa, cobalt and cadmium and all these other things, I just there was just a fire here in New York. Because some lithium batteries, uh, you know, all these new electric electric carts and stuff, they have lithium ba batteries and with these electric bicycles and scooters and stuff. And the li lithium batteries are highly flammable. Is this some way that we could take, and then you can't, what these batteries and even the little batteries that we have in our phones and other things, you're not supposed to just throw those away because they're toxic. And when you throw them into the landfill, they seep, seep mm. out and, and, and poison the land and make it the land what they call a gray zone or a brown zone, a brown field. Um, so is there a way that we can render these things that were created in the 20th century and that still be created now inert so they can be reabsorbed back to the earth and not be toxic to the land, not poison the groundwater, not poison our oceans and our lakes and our streams, not cause cancer. This is how we will have to start thinking for the 21st century because it's there's so much garbage that it's not you know if we leave it it's not gonna it's not gonna break down um, anytime soon and and, and and perhaps a thousand years it may not break down and worse uh, plastics plastics don't totally break down but they break down enough where now they could be in our oceans as these little microscopic bubbles that our fish are eating and ingesting and in turn we're ingesting. And I was just listening to a, a, a report the other day that was talking about irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. And irritable bowel syndrome is because of, they were saying maybe linked to these microplastics. Well, what happens when people throw their plastic and it gets into the water? The water makes the plastic soft, and the soft the plastic break, breaks down into these little what they call microplastics, which are like little um, little nodules. Uh, we some some of this is some you can see and some are so small we can't really see it. But the fish and the other other life are ingesting it, and when we ingest fish, we're ingesting it too. And when we drink the water because it's in the water, uh, we ingest it also. And so a lot of these problems that uh, we are we're dealing with nowadays, irritable bowel syndrome, these problems with leaky gut, and all these other you know. Uh, uh, things that are plaguing us, these cancers that are plaguing us, plaguing us maybe directly, uh, in a large way, directly was, uh, linked to the mess that we're creating or the mess that humanity is creating under, under the Western world and, and capitalism. Mm. Well, but, uh, we need to get back to, to Pan-Africanism. No, that is Pan-Africanism because because this is a problem that collectively we have to solve. And by going back to our spirituality and, and, and thinking like Africans and not and, and thinking like Africans before co colonialization, this is something that I'm sure we will be able to figure out. And, and one of the things my mom had, would say, had, has said growing up, me growing up, is, you know, we, we haven't even lived as long as dinosaurs. And, you know, the earth, has been here way before um, humans and, and and will exist way after. And if we mess it up so much that it's uninhabitable from human, for human beings, the earth will figure out a way to consume it and recycle it. And then maybe next go around when human beings come back on the planet, they won't do the same thing again. So I personally, um, you know, if you look at the demographics and age, circling back to what you had said earlier, where we have this large population, we meaning Africans, have this large population of young people on the continent, we have an opportunity from a pan-African, pre-colonial, African spiritually centered frame of mind to reclaim what is ours. And you know, how can we individually and collectively think of how we can become African minded again. The only what the only way that we can be Pan African is to think like an African. Each individual has to think like an African. In in our own language, 
in, in, in the, well, not in our own language, but in the language that we speak in, which unfortunately a lot of us, it's a colonial language, it's a European language. Absolutely. What am I talking about? So, so in America, in, in, in English, when we think of the family, we think of the father, the mother, brother, sister, you know, that, that core family, and then you have the immediate family, and then you have, you know, other, you know, second cousin, first cousin. Extended cousin. family. Right. Do you know that in, in many African languages, do you know that in many African languages, the thought is different, right? So what do I mean? So in, in, in many African languages, the same word that you use for brother and sister is the same word that you use for cousin. Of course, you know, the masculine and the feminine. Mm -hmm. So the same word that you use for your brother is the same way that you refer to your male cousin. The same word that you use for your sister is the same word that you use for your sister cousins, your uh, female cousins, excuse me. So what that is telling us is in, in African culture, the way that we think about family is different. We look at our cousins as our brothers and sisters. We look at our uncles and aunties as important fixtures in our family. We look at elders as important fixtures in our family, not throw away people like in Western c culture, not people that are a burden as in Western culture, not people that we can put in a home be, uh, and, and live our lives as in Western culture. Language tells us a lot about the people. I, I remember years before I moved in where, where I am now, I was taking a class at the Chinese Cultural Center. I couldn't finish because I missed one class and, and it was they, she was going so fast I couldn't catch up, so I, I stopped. But I was taking the Mandarin class. And again, that language. In Mandarin, there's a different word for, there are different words, rather, for brothers and sisters. It tells you how the Chinese think in terms of stratifying people and their importance in the group. So there's a word for my older, my first oldest brother. There's a word for my second oldest brother. There's a word for the brothers that are underneath, you know, that are directly underneath me. You know, it, the, 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 the words for brother are in relation to where you are in the family line in terms of the structure. You know, the first son is right. always the most important, right? Um, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a stratification of levels in Chinese language when it's related to people. And that tells you exactly how Chinese people think. It tells you where they place important. The importance is on the first male son. The importance is on, on the boys rather than the girls. The importance is on listening to father. The, you know, uh, the importance is on the group rather than me as an individual. You know, again, an African concept, we all are important. I am important. The group is important. And I am important. And, you know, the group cannot exist without me. And I can't exist without the group. That's the African thought, and it's expressed in our language. So language is one of the ways that we can uh, re-Africanize our minds because it tells us a lot about how we think. Or so they tell us a lot because it's more than one African language or dialect or however you want to say it. I agree with that. I agree with that. The, the point I was... The, the, point, the point I was making was where we are right now in whatever European language you're thinking in, we still have to re-Africanize our mind with the language that we have access to at the moment. I do, however, agree with you that we need to learn an African language simply because of what you were saying. Language is the verbalization of culture, period. And so if you're using a European language, then your frame of culture has been shifted by the words, the grammar structure, the um, the syntax, just the rules, all of that, because um, because because the, the the language is the is the expression of culture. English is, from my experience and from what I've studied, 
which is not a lot, I'm not a linguist, is an incredibly lazy language. The only thing that you use in English is the tip of your tongue. Mm, that's it. In Spanish, you roll your R's. In French, you use the whole nasal passage up here. In African languages that I've heard, we, you know, we, we have click sounds. We use the whole mouth from the tip of the tongue all the way to the back, down the throat. We use the nasal passages. I mean, there's there's so much activity. There's vibration in African languages. There is tone um, that makes that changes the, the 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 definition. As a matter of fact, I had one of my guests, Emo Odo. He was saying the the way you say it with a different tone may say something else. It, you know, so um, there's life and vitality in African languages. And we definitely need to learn these African languages. Um, one of the things that I do that, that I'll say that we still see in our culture, or we did see before um, integration, before the crack epidemic, really before the crack epidemic, we lived in our communities, in our black communities before gentrification, which is really modern day colonization. You had your mom and your grandma and your great grandmama. You might've had some cousins. Y'all lived in the same house then there was nothing wrong with that. And everybody called grandma, big mama, everybody called her mama. And so there was this understanding of respecting elders based upon the languages, uh, based upon the, the word that we chose, big mama. Everybody called big mama, big mama. You know what I'm saying? Um, I know a couple of, of different scenarios and I'm sure I'm not the only one where you have cousins who are being raised like brothers and sisters. If you are close with a family, then they call you your brother. You 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 call people, you know, their cousins. And, and it gets to the point where like, you really might not know who's blood related. All you know is they call each other brothers. They call each other cousins or whatever. I worked at this school. Um, um, I, I worked at New Britain High School in New Britain, Connecticut. It has a very large black and brown population. Everybody called everybody their brother, their cousin, their sister. I didn't know who was related to whom simply because a part of the a part of the culture was so dominated by continental Africans, black Americans, Caribbean blacks, um, black Latinos, and and everybody was everybody cousin. So there there is um remnants of that that is still a part of the way that we relate to each other, if it's not necessarily strictly in our language. But I do agree, we got to learn our African languages. Swahili, I think, is the language that most Africans on the continent speak. Do you know if that's true? I think it's Swahili, then Yoruba. Somebody said something about Swahili up here. Swahili is a commercial language. It's a commercial language primarily on the east coast of Africa. Right. Yeah, so it's still spoken. What do you mean by commercial? Most Africans. Just for transactional trade for business? Yeah, they use it for business. So that's primarily, uh, um, you know, uh, commercial. It's mostly for business on the east coast. Africans on the west coast don't really uh, speak Swahili. Right. There might be people that, you know, that are pan African and study that might uh, learn it. But most Africans actually know several languages. Right. They know the colonizer language, they know the ethnic groups language, and they know that the, the, the languages or the dialects of neighboring ethnic groups or sub subgroups and they're able to communicate in, in, in many different languages we can't say the same here in america as, as that's the show americans we like we know english and we might know spanish or french if we took a year two or three i got took three of uh, spanish in school but i never actually got to have conversations with people so i could read it but i can't really you know right i can't really speak it you know very fluently conversationally but most of us didn't take two or three years or even if, uh, uh, beyond the year of uh, Spanish or French. And so American tongue, like you said, is very, very lazy. But I wanted to very. go back to what you were talking about the, in the community growing up and, um, um, you know, the folks calling each other's cousins and brothers and sisters. That is something that we carry. And that, that is proof of Pan-Africanism, if you want to think about it, right, because that is a tradition that we carry through the hills of North America and the, 
Caribbean. You know, here in America, when there was so-called emancipation, the people were set free, and many people went looking for their family members. You know, they left the plantations. Um, they, you know, went looking for husbands, wives, or whatever. But there were people, there were older people in the community that didn't have any family. And all the older people became our uncles and aunties. We, we absorbed them into our That's families. That's right. Right? And so if you look down your lineage, when you look down your lineage, you might see somebody in the, in the, the, the lineage, you know, the, the family tree might say that, that's uncle this or auntie that, but they're really not biologically your uncle or auntie. They were absorbed because we understand that as African people, we are all family, right? That's right. And we had this through, through enslavement through the early 1900s and, and you know and until, until recently, where we had this phenomenon of people separating themselves from family and not appreciating them, you know, as much as we used to anyway, because people still, even, you know, people still create uh, notions of family, right? But it's, it's not quite the same as what it was. For instance, my grandmother has an older, had an older sister, God bless both of their spirits, they, their ancestors now. And my grandmother's older sister, uh, you know, was having issues with her, 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 one of her daughters. My grandmother brought her daughter into her house and was raising, you know, raise, raising her daughter. Uh, uh, and my family, and, you know, my immediate family, now I'm talking about with my mom, my mother took in young people into our house and they let them live with us, uh, you know, raised them like she was raising me and my sister and my brother, my bio, you know, my biologicals. You know, so we have we have extended brothers and sisters. I have two or three moms. You know, I have my best friend Dorsey's mom. I, uh, I have my, my friend Mark Slater's mom. I, I called her Muffy. God bless her. She's an ancestor too. You know, I have many community mothers. You know, I have I, I don't really have a lot of community fathers. I, Dr. J, brother Small, is like fathers to me. Actually, I spent more time with Dr. J, brother Small, than I spent with my own biological father. And uh, but I have a lot of grandfather. I have community grandfathers. You know, I have community. Uh, I have my uncle who became like a father figure to me in many aspects. He wasn't able to spend a lot of time with me, but he was able to spend some quality time with me and teach me some things about photography. You know, about how to ride a bike and things like that. That you know, that quote unquote father should be teaching you. So I, I've had you know, I've had male, uh, excellent male role models, excellent female. Uh, role models and extended family uh, as my family. And I think a lot of us have. And I, I think that's the practice that we are losing nowadays for, you know, it, uh, the, the losing is being accelerated by some of the different things we're being subjected to under the empire. But uh, we, that, that, that whole, that idea of a family and uh, exalting people as family is a very African or pan-African idea that's that's ingrained in our culture yeah it's ingrained in our and psyche people, i mean people in the caribbean do it also people in the caribbean do it also like people when i was growing up people used to come here uh you know to work the mother and father come here to work and i imagine it's still going on people come to america to work or they go to england or europe somewhere to work and auntie this one or grandma or your uh, grandma or nanny but somebody is back home in the Caribbean raising their children and they send what they call, you know, technically they call them middles. You know, they're sending money back to the Caribbean to the folks taking care of their children to take care of the family, the children and the family that's, you know, back in the islands or wherever they are, Central South America. That's a very African uh, concept. Mm -hmm. It's in the same line with what I was speaking about earlier. So we don't realize how, 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 how you know close we are to our uh, you know in our practices to our African roots, and if we can realize how common you know how common the things that we do are as a peoples, you know no matter where we are, I think we would be a lot better off. I mean, people like to point out that you know the, you know there's a lot of YouTube videos and stuff where people talk about how Africans view African Americans and things like you know there there are there are differences and that we need to work on as a as a global African community, but the differences between Africans on the continent is not really any different, you know, than African-Americans. 
are not any different than East Coast Africans and West Coast Africans. We were, we, you know, you opened up, you remember there was this big beef East Coast, West Coast, right? I'm not that old. Yeah, I'm not as old as you, Charles. Oh, okay. Well, I'm old enough. I'm speaking for myself there. And I'm old enough to remember. The I am East too. West Coast, big beef, I am too. Tupac beef. I'm old enough to remember, you know, people going down south. And, you know, the girls would be like, oh, you from Brooklyn? And the dudes would be like, hey, fuck that nigga. <laughs> so, that, I mean, that people like to blow it out of proportion. I mean, there's some things, like I said, we got to work on. Right. Like the continental Africans and Africans from the Caribbean and African Americans. But we've always worked together. We've always worked together to find solutions and to support each other and each other's uh, revolutionary struggles. I wanted to read some stuff from uh, some things from a uh, a piece that Dr. Clark wrote. Yes. Uh, on uh, Pan Africanism. Let me see if I can get it up. His computer, man. I'm going to fight your computer. That's why we relate, y'all. Your His computer. <laughs> um, did I, Do I have it? Is it? No, I, you didn't give it to me. No. If you don't have it, it's not. So there's a there's an article that Dr. Clark wrote that is on this is not that's not the page I was looking for. This is that one page. There's an article that Dr. Clark wrote that's on jstore.org, uh, Pan Africanism, a brief history of, of an idea in the African world. Uh, let me see if I can get to one other thing. Pan Africanism was often thought of as a movement conceived and developed by Africans living outside Africa. Pan-Africanism was, in fact, a worldwide movement affecting Africans in every part of the world. An operational definition of Pan-Africanism is long overdue. Generally, we think of it as a 20th century phenomenon. In fact, this was a worldwide movement that used different approaches, depending on the political climate and the countries where African people lived in large numbers. In Africa itself, Pan-Africanism was often expressed through armed resistance to slavery and colonialism. There is a need for an operational definition of the former that will explain its many manifestations in different places under different circumstances. All over the world, Africans were fighting to restore what slavery and colonialism had taken away from them. No matter what their circumstances were, their objective was the same. Slavery and colonialism strained, but did not, on front page 27, did not completely break the com com cultural umbilical cord between the Africans in Africa and those who by forced migration now live in what is called the Western world. A small group of African Americans and Caribbean writers, teachers, and preachers collectively developed the basis of what would be an African consciousness movement over 100 years ago. Their concern was with Africa in general and Egypt and Ethiopia and what we now call the Nile Valley in particular. In the years before emancipation of the slaves in the United States and in the Caribbean islands, these blacks had barely mastered their conqueror's language. However, in spite of their lack of formal training, their first writings reflected a concern for Africa as their homeland. The great African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois describes the situation in this manner. From the 15th through the 17th century, all right, now we're talking about, we're talking about 1400s through the 1600s, right? Well before the founding of Amer the you know, United States of America, and then right after, you know, right in the middle of all this process of Africans being stolen from Africa, stolen. The Africans imported to Africa to America regarded themselves as temporary settlers destined to return eventually to Africa. The increasing revolts against the slave system, which culminated in the 18th century, showed a feeling of close kinship to the motherland. And even well into the 19th century, they call their organization African This, as witnessed the African unions of New York and Newport and the African churches, like the African Methodist Episcopal Church, mm -hmm. or Africa, or AME Zion, the so forth, of Philadelphia and New York. In the West Indies and South America, there was even closer indication of feelings of kinship with Africa and the East. So there's, there's more mm -hmm. I can read, but I wanted to stay on that talk. So for folks that are always talking about we are different people, you need to talk to your ancestors because your ancestors understood clearly who they were. They identified, even though they all they were presented with to 
to learn about themselves may have been Ethiopia from what, from what they were culturally practicing and formally, you know, they, they use the Bible to teach us about, you know, being good slaves, but Africans saw the Ethiopia and they, and they clung to that Ethiopia, you know, and, 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 you know, they, when they were referring to themselves with honor, they always referred back to that Ethiopian group. African people have always been trying to reconnect or connect themselves with their motherland. Mm -hmm. So for these folks that are trying to talk about where Indians and all the, you know, where we're from here and all that, you need to talk to your ancestors, right? Because some of your ancestors may yes have been on this continent before the American, uh, before the American uh, experiment, but your ancestors come from the continent of Africa. Period. You need to, you need to uh, ask somebody. <laughs> you need to ask somebody. Um, Brother Charles, what's the name of the book, the source that you just read from? It is, well, let me go back to the first page. This is an article. Uh, with, um, Dr. Leonard uh, Jeffries, right? Dr. J wrote this? No, this is not, this is Dr. John. This is an article oh. on Presence African. And it is by Dr. John Henry Clark. It's called Pan-Africanism, A Brief History of an Idea. Wait, okay, a brief. It was, it was in the book, President, President. Uh, Hold on. Pan-Africanism, then colon, colon, a brief. Pan-Africanism, colon, a brief history of an idea. So, yes, I'm okay. To find the first page of it, yeah. A brief history of an idea in the African world. This is by Dr. This is by John Henry Clark, with the E Henry K T N R I K, uh, and it's in Presents African. Presents African, for those who don't know, was a journal that was put out by Alion Diop and his wife. Alion Diop and his and his wife had a very close relate. They not biologically related. But they are getting that African kinship feeling uh, of Sheikh Anta Diop. They supported Sheikh Anta Diop at his work when he was trying to get his, his uh, PhD thesis through. They co called the community together. And Dr. J talks about this in such a grand way. I could you know, picture it when he tells the story. But when Diop was, um, you know, you have to defend your dissertation. And, uh, you know, the first time they turned him down. So Aliun Diop and his wife had called the African community in Paris together That's to right. come, go into the space to lend their support to the brother as he defended his dissertation uh, again. And, and he helped actually, to, him and his wife helped to nurture many people besides Sheikh Anta Diop. I believe they also nurtured Theophilo Benga, if I'm not mistaken, but you know, they, they nurtured many Africans in Senegal where they were from. And, and, and you know, France and Paris specifically, where they had set up uh, Presence African as a kind of a think tank publisher uh, uh, for the African world. And Africans from all over the world contributed work to it. Uh, Dr. Clark contributed to it. Uh, uh, Dr. Last night, Dr. J was reading a piece by Hufet, Felix Hufet, when he, the first president of um, of. Uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivy Coast. Charles, uh, before you go African further into that, what's the name of the what's the name of the journal? Presence African. Pre so uh, listen, listen, y'all. I don't speak French. I already clicked it. I already unclicked on it. So Presence Africans. Y'all gonna have to figure that out. Your girl does not speak French. Senegalese, Haitian, Nathan. No, I, I spell it Hold on. Wait, wait. P R E. Uh huh. S E N C E. Uh huh. S E N C E. Uh huh. And African is A F R I C A I N E. Now this is a this is a little hyphen or something somewhere. Yeah, there are a couple of hyph hyphens up. There's a, there's a hyphen over the Listen, y'all, it's French. So yeah. it's going to have all kind of hyphens and accent marks and stuff that I don't know how it's to write. If you, if you type it in the English way, it'll, it'll pop up. So, it's African, but it's on, there's a site called JSTOR. 
J Storm. S-T-O-R. Read up to 100 articles a month on J-Storm. S-T-O-R. Right. You can also go. S-S-S as in Sam, T as in Tom, O as in Orange, R as in Robert. Yep. I, I, um, it's up there now. And then there's also Academia. Academia.edu has a lot of good uh, articles and research uh, materials on it also. Listen, y'all, uh, Charles is giving these to me fast. So y'all going to have to, I'm clicking. He, he's telling I'm typing and clicking. Y'all going to have to write it down. Okay. <laughs> I tell him, tell him what something to write with. Because cause Charles act like he's sitting right next to me. And I'm just, you know, like Violet Newstead yeah, from 9 to 5. They need to. I tell them all the time. We here to learn, right? Turn so, text it. They doing something. Type it in the notes on their cell phone. Some of y'all got this fast fingers. I use the swipe myself, but some people are. <laughs> they can move. They can move their fingers fast. My thumbs are too big and clumsy. <laughs> Now, That's listen, they and know
You see this? Um, you know, uh, of where we are presently. I see it. I see it. Appreciation of where we are presently. Appreciation of the past that preceded us. And understanding that we need to learn from our past That's to, right. to proceed into the future wisely. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. Everything that we do as African people has multiple dimensions, multiple meanings. It's not just the one thing of, uh, oh, this is just clothes. Right? And it's something that is universally understood in our people, as you know, the culture that, that is coming from, right? So, so I'll just look around here and see if I see something. So, all right, so, hmm, trying to think of a good, a good understanding. So, in the corner, I have my, uh, what we refer to affectionately as an Iggy stick, an Agon stick. So, when you look at my stick, it has nine different colored ribbons around it. Nine referring to, nine is the number of um, uh, Oya, right? And Oya is one of the principles, I mean, there's other principles to it, but essentially o Oya in the, in the myth aspect of it is related to the caretaking of the place where the, the dead resides, the, you know, the cemetery. And so the stick, you know, you look at it, you see it's a, a colored stick, right? And it's, I could use it to walk, but I also use it to, it has tassels, it has um, bells on the end of it. And I use it in the ritual when I want to, you know, bring the energy in of my ancestors and the ancestors of my ultra line into my house. So it, so it, it has a, it has an artistic, you know, quality to it as we think of art in the West that it looks pretty is like little multicolored rainbows on it. You know, it's a nice, nice size stick and, you know, and Western art, people would interpret it as they may, as it appeals to them uh, uh, individually. But as an African, when I look at that, I say, okay, I know it's pretty. Can you get it what so we can see it? What the of that is. With the... No, I'm not showing you on my Iggy stick. <laughs> I'm not showing y'all. I'll show you here. I'll show you from the corner. Okay. Okay. Uh, you, you might be able to barely see it. No, we can see it. If they can see it, how I can see it, you can see it. I do Hold on, hold on a second. Let me see if I can turn okay. the camera around. All right. As you'll see my books and stuff all over. My laundry I got to do. You'll be talking about me like y'all did uh, uh, Umar, Brother Umar. <laughs> so that, that was my icky stick. Let me see at the bottom. Uh, I don't know if y'all can see it. At the bottom, I have my bells on the bottom of it. And I actually need to declare this space. I got my brother was living with me, so I had to go to my space, but I had a space over here for with coffee and things for my ancestors. And you know, this is space to feed my my Egon, my ancestors, or the community ancestors. And uh, I have to clean my space back up. Clean my books. Thank you, brother Charles. Listen, so nobody want to turn their camera around. Listen, we'll talk about that afterwards. I, I don't even know what you're talking about. We'll talk about that afterwards because we're going to have to wrap up. We've been on for, for a minute. We, we've been on for
right. Mess. There's a mess. That's my mess, and I clean it up when I get out. When you got kids, you ain't got time to do all of that, and you got to give them snacks on the run to this <laughs> activity or that activity. And I was like, man, I don't know how to be. I'm looking at their parents' cars, a single guy from Jesus. So I, I couldn't sit in this car. But having my godson for one day, at the end of the day, I, was, I looked at, at the back seat in the car. I was like, oh, I see why that car's <laughs> Now I see why it's janky. Yeah, children, children, children. Uh-huh. Oh, goodness. Okay. Yeah. Charles, Brother Charles, also Keele, Charles Mitchell, thank you so much for your for coming on and, and having this conversation about Pan-Africanism and moving Pan-Africanism forward. Um, just to kind of summarize some of the things that we talked well, wait, about. Wait, wait, wait. No, wait, we can't summarize yet. I, and I still need to invite these folks to the Pan-African Federalist Movement. And as the New York... Uh, Deputy Coordinator, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to go into 2022 peacefully if I did not mention it. You you doubt me? You doubt me, Charles. Charles, you doubt me. I, listen. No, you're talking about summer rise. I, listen. You're talking about summer rise. This, this, is, this is my show. Otherwise, Family, he trying to take over my show. Listen, okay. I'm going to summarize. I'm going to give the mic back to you. Connecticut. How about that? Connecticut. I'm not from Boston. I'm from I'm from Hartford. I said Brooklyn, not Boston. I am. He's Boston. His name is Boston. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. So. Hi, Boston. I I want to I want to thank everyone for being on the the wildest Tuesday talk I've ever had. <laughs> Uh, we, a couple, I'm going to say two things. I'm going to give the mic back to, um, um, brother Charles initiation, um, applications for initiation are open for the shrine of my aunt. Um, if you, you can go to uh, shrine of my aunt.org, which I have tagged in, um, in the, uh, here on the stream yard and, and information about initiation and the application is there. So please. Uh, if you're interested in initiation, just go to the go to the page. If you have any questions, you can email um, one of us and at the shrine, and we'll be able to assist you. All of that information is on the shrine, at shrineofmyaunt.org. I see people who are thanking us for the conversation. We got off track a little bit. We started late. We had to shift platforms, and it was it was nice and chill. It was a lot of fun, um, and and I saw in the chat people were having conversations. You know. People, somebody made a mistake, apologize. It's okay, my brother. That's the way that things are supposed to go. Charles corrected me and, and made me say something in a more clear and concise way so that it's that it makes sense. That's the kind of stuff that we need to do, brothers and sisters, so that we can make sure we understand what we're saying, first of all, and saying it in a way that is received clearly and that we're able to just communicate with each other and give each other the benefit of the doubt because we, we are all we have, just like um, G Money said on New Jack City, we all we got. Okay? We all we got. To summarize, some ways to be Pan-African, learn a Pan-African language, Swahili, um, Yoruba, um, in any a, a language from um or from any part of the continent, and then some of the other um sub, I don't want to say sub-language to make it seem like it's less than a language. But you have languages that like maybe a cluster of families know something along those lines and it's important so that we you can start to shift your brain back to an african perspective because again language is the verbalization of culture okay so learn a language um at the shrine of ma'at um anika our high priestess teaches the medu nature then there's also um medu medunetter.com with dr raketi amen she teaches um, the Medu Nature uh, brother Sanjeti he, at the Temple of Anu. He teaches um, the Medu Nature in Pudishi teaches the Medu Nature. Medu Nature. So you, we have people in our own communities that can teach that. Try my art, Sanjeti, in Pudishi, Medunetter.com. Okay, learn an African language. The other thing is to have dialogue 
and conversation with each other, giving each other the benefit of the doubt. These superficial, artificial, relatively non-existent differences among continental Africans, Black Americans, Caribbean um, Blacks, European Black, like, stop it. I, I'd be wanting to smack people with that nonsense because it makes no sense and it needs to stop, okay? Give each other the benefit of the doubt. Recognize that these people are your brothers and sisters. These people are your family. Their place where their direct relatives come from was literally a different stop on the enslavement trade, like literally, okay? And that person who is from these different islands or from the United States, like all four of my grandparents are, could really have a lineage that literally goes back to the same relative, okay? So when you start to look at what's, what's similar, and, and then, then the, the differences seem superficial and ridiculous because they are, okay? Learn a language, give each other the benefit of the doubt, read some books on Pan-Africanism, on our African history, our African ancestry, um, Black American history, which is really American history. So read, read some revolutionary authors from other countries so you can see the similarities in terms of how we are all uh, uh, fighting for the same thing, even if we don't know it, okay? So the last thing that I'm gonna do is turn the mic back over to Asukile, brother Charles, and he is going to take us home with um, very important information, okay? That's gonna guide us through the rest of this year, which is like four or five days, and into uh, 2022 and beyond. The mic is yours. I don't know if you can pull up images, but I'm, I'm going to show this image why it has to save you some work. Today is uh, the third principle of the Nguva, Nguva Saba, and Nguva Linus. The principle of Saba, that, that is that's collective work through Kujima, a collective work and responsibility. Uh, Drive for to build and maintain our community get together and make our brothers and sisters' problems our problems and to solve them together. How appropriate that we had discussed the Pan Africanism on the day of Uj Ujima or Ujima. Uh, we as people will have to figure out collectively how we're going to move forward into the 20, 2022 and, the, and indeed the whole 21st century. Uh, Chinese are making moves, big moves on the continent. America, America has what they call AFRICOM, African Command. They've now consolidated the African theater of operations with the European theater of operations because they realize the moves that China's uh, uh, moving to build a new Silk Road where they control the trade and resources and eventually resources will mean land. Uh, in Africa, Asia, all of the rest of Asia outside of China, and into Europe, and, and even into America, even though they haven't really said that, but uh, China has these super tankers that takes its products all around the world. And as we've seen during uh, COVID, when China had to set, shut down its manufacturing, the rest of the world had shortages because everybody is going to China for manufacturing now, but China gets its raw materials from Africa. And so China is really making moves on Africa and we, we, in the same way that Europeans made their move on Africa, uh, you know, in, in the 19th and 20th centuries. So we as Africans, if we ever hope to have a future in this, in this century, we have to really get it together. We have to really work to build our politics, economics, and culture. And so one of those ways that we could do that is uh, working with the organization or the movement, because it's not really an organization, more so it's a movement, the Pan-African Federalist Movement. And uh, I am the New York State Deputy Coordinator for uh, for, for New York State. And uh, there, there are several reasons, I think it's eight, nine reasons that the PAF is working on building uh, coordinated committees for. We have you know, we have regional committees and under those committees are state or provincial committees and then if we could get it more organized like here in New York state, 
We can either have uh, the cities where there's high black population. We can have local coordinating committees in each of those cities. But um, we are working in the PAS to bring about the United African States, not in somebody else's lifetime, not in the next lifetime, not in the, I might not see it, but we're going to get there like uh, time, but by the year, by the end of this, this decade, by 2030, we would like to see a free and independent, building of its resources, self-determined African continent with a place in citizenship and, and repatriation opportunities and def defense uh, of its peoples across the world by this unified African government. And so uh, uh, I said there were eight or nine regions. Those regions, there's five on the continent, north, south, east, west, and central Africa. There's uh, Europe. There's Asia. There's, there's North America and South America and the Caribbean islands. And so those are the regions. And within those regions, you, you have a state or provincial uh, state, meaning in, in our case in, in you know, the U.S., uh, state meaning North, like New York, Connecticut, and so forth. But in other places, state might mean like on the continent of Africa, it might mean Nigeria, Ghana, so forth, the independent nations, right? And our, our hope is to, to to generate from amongst the people because the authority of the, the politicians, the authority of those who we consider our governmental leaders comes from the people. And so the people will have to demand this, that the people have to be, the people who have to realize how important this is to their future, right? Everybody else is in Africa, succeeding in Africa, or succeeding from Africa's resources with African people, right? And something's wrong with that. So we as African people have to look at our leadership and demand what is best for us, not as what in their bet, not as what is in their best interest, not in what is the best interest of for Europeans and Asians and other people. African leaders and African governments have to put African people first, right? And we have that power, but we've been sleeping on how much powerful we are. But now is the time for the African people, the sleeping giant of us, to wake up, to realize what we have in our hands. Uh, Adam Clayton Paul used to say, what's in your hand, black man? What's in your hand, black man and woman? We have the continent of Africa, but we're running from Africa while everybody else is running into Africa to get its resources. So Africa is the solution for us as African people. The, the, the land where our blood, sweat, and tears is, more so than America or the Caribbean or any of these other places, our ancestral lines are in that soil over there. That's right. Right? The resources of the soil can provide, not, and more so than jobs, it, it, the resources can help us to create businesses for ourselves, businesses that we control, businesses that we can create jobs for our other brothers and sisters. If they just, because some people don't mind working for other people, and some people want to control their own destiny. So, if you whether you want to be a business person or whether you want a job, you can. The resources are in Africa. Everybody else is going to Africa, but they taking it and taking it to their country to refine, to, to, to create the world components. Well, now even with China, China is creating the world components in Africa and bringing their people there to control the process, and then taking that and putting the pieces, the components together in China and selling it to the world. But we can do everything that anybody else can do, we can do. And we can, we can do it, and we can do it better, and we have done it better than other folks. And this is, this is the power in them keeping us uneducated and unknowing about our greatness. Because we, we do it better. We do it better, family. They kept black folks out of the you know, out of business for so long here in America. They kept us enslaved. And then, not even, you know, what is it, 1868 comes around. And within 20 years, we have created the beginnings of Black Wall Street, Little Africa's, you know, black townships all over America within 20 years. And so, you know, and during the quote unquote reconstruction period, we do it better, family. We do it better. 
And they're scared of us because they know we do it better. So they keep us out of opportunities. Hell, they even keep us out of the sports family because they know that we do it better. They kept us out of the NBA for so long. And then we created our own low charters. We created our own things and uh, was blown away. And then when they let one of us in, when they let Jackie Robinson in into baseball, he blew it away. When they let Jim Brown into NFL, uh, he blew it away. Whenever we get into it, it's just to be in us to be the best. So that's why they have to maintain a structure to keep us down. But I digress. So what I'm saying is that when it comes to Africa and the future for African people, we need to look back to Africa. We can do it better because we have done it better and we can do it better again. Not in 50 years, not in 20 years. We can do it by the end of this decade. All that's required is that we have the mindset for it. So I'm encouraging you all to help me, help the folks in the, in the Pan-African Federalist Movement, whether you're an individual or whether you're in an organization, because we want to unify individual people. We want to unify the organizations. But that's why I said it's not, a, a, it's not an organization per se. It's a movement. It's a coalition to, to bring about a united African states that can benefit all African peoples across the diaspora, whether on the continent or not. We could create a government that can defend African people that could not on the continent. So when there's skirmishes on the continent, the unified government can deal with it itself rather than the UN or somebody else coming in there trying to intermediate. We can handle our own in-house battles, you know, our own in-house problems. We don't need interlopers, people coming in and, and honestly coming in really to, you know, create division more so and divide us so that they can take advantage of the division to get something for themselves. We can handle it in, in house. We can create businesses for ourselves. We can create a situation where you, if you want to live here, because many people are not attached to America, you can live here in America and still own land in, in Ghana or Tanzania or someplace. And that would be your right as a citizen of the United African States. You can have dual citizenship. Or if you want, or if you want to just repatriate and you're tired of America and Trump and the jab and all of the stuff, you just want to go home and, and, and see people that look like you every day running things. You would be able to do that in the United African States. And so, so I, I ask you to see the potential realities. I ask you to think bigger than your current situations. I'm asking you to think bigger than your current organizations because, I mean, it's fine to be in an organization that's working on a particular goal, but it's bigger than just any one organization. It's about all of us as African people. And really, it's about which direction humanity is going to go. Because we, as we talked about at the beginning, we are the first, we are the prime. We are the mothers and fathers of the human family. And as long as we continue to let our children run the house, the house is going to be in chaos. It's time for the mothers and fathers of the human family That's right. to step up. And you know, I, I, I see Sai, she chuckled a little bit. You know what a house is like when the children run the house and the parents don't have no control? I don't, because like, they ain't never grow up in a house, house like that. Like, right? It's uh, a hot it's mess. mess. Okay, all right. Uh, all right, but I, I walked into some houses with the children out of control and the parents that, well, I don't know what's wrong with Billy. I don't know what's, what's wrong with Jesse May. I, I can't control him. You let your kids run your I house. Can't control him. You just have abdicated your authority. That's right. Y'all start hiring. Yeah. So it's time for the adults of the human family to to take back control of the house. That's the right. House, That's right. Planet Earth. And we can do it. Now, people say it's a dream, right? And I, I, I want to say this, and I always say this, because people say that we can't do this in 10 years or, you know, by 2030, right? I said, why can't you? I seem to recall that in a period just shortly before 1776, George Washington and some slave master bastards got together or decided they were going to get together, and then they spent a the hot summer in Philadelphia and then the stuffy 
building that came out with a declaration of independence and within in less than 10 years they had their independence i seem to recall a period in, in french history where the french uh uh proletariat meaning the poor people got tired of, of marie antoinette and louis the 14th and others and within less than 10 years they had a resolution and, and changed the structure of their government i seem to remember a period of the Protestant Reformation, when white, when ordinary white folk, or not so ordinary, these were, these were, uh, I guess in some terms you would call them bourgeoisie, but the educated people got tired of the Catholic Church telling them that they could not speak to God directly for themselves, right? And so they had a Protestant for Reformation where they said that I could speak to God for myself. I don't need that you as an intercessor to intercede on my behalf. I can speak to God directly myself. I can read the Bible myself. I don't need your, I don't need you Catholic church to do this. Right. And that was in less than 10 years. Right? So we can change our reality. We can redefine what power means for us. Again, I said power is the ability to define reality and have others respond to that definition as if it were your own. It's time for us to define reality for ourselves and take back our power. So family, I'm asking you at this point to become part to uh, whether as an individual or whether as an organization in, in coordination with other organizations in our community. Let's organize black people to build a groundswell from the people to call for leadership and there's already been great success, by the way. There's about 22, 23, uh, uh, you know, governments on the continent of all you know, people in the leadership and governments of the continent that are agreeing to this. You know, that are agreeing that this is the way that, that we need to go. And the mind of, you know, in, in alignment with what Garvey taught us, in alignment with what Kwame Nkrumah was trying to build. African people are tired of always being at the bottom looking up at others african people are tired of people coming into their community or their nation and getting wealthy and then extracting the wealth and taking it back to their communities african people are tired of this and it's been showing in these last two years of covid so now is a prime time for us to prepare ourselves as african people for a 21st century that reflects what we need and what we want and what our children would, and their children and their children's children would need and want. Now is a time of great, great promise for us as African people, whether it's things that are going on here in New York, whether what's going on in America, whether it's things going on on the continent itself. There's a lot of things that show that the spirit is with us, family, that our ancestors are with us, that the creator is with us, that the Orisha, the Netshu, the Abosum, the Loa are with us, family. That's now is us. our time to be prepared for the 21st century and make these moves that we need to make. So I'm not asking you to join the Pan African Fellows Movement and help us to move forward this concept of the United African States before the year 2030. So if you're interested, uh, you can reach out to me. You don't need time to get a pen and a pencil. You can reach out to me at Charles V. Maybe two L's. Charles, a, uh, wait, go slow. Uh, Charles V. What? Give me a call nine one seven. Hold on, wait, uh, wait, Charles. I'm typing what you're saying. Charles V. Mitchell. Charles V. Mitchell. Uh huh. I'm going to Charles C H A L E S V. Mitchell with two L's. Mitchell M I T C H E L L. Uh huh. At gmail. Okay. At gmail.com. Uh huh. You can give me a call at 9171. I was looking for the flyer with the, the uh, PAFM. Uh, 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 website but I couldn't, couldn't find it and, 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 and so family I just tagged I just tagged his his contact information Charles V Mitchell at gmail.com 
917-561-3581 is right there. Any and all questions, hit them up. There it is. You missed this, you missed that. What's that book? What's that website? Boom. Yeah, y'all can hit me up with this. Uh, and so, yeah, you can hit me up about the PASM if you have a question. Maybe uh, if you just want to talk about uh, what's going on with you, maybe get. Uh, yeah, I'm not a counselor by trade, but since I was a little, since I was a little boy, people used to always just uh, come up to me and just start talking to me, and I'd be like, "Why is this?" But I guess that's you know, as an adult now, I think that's, that's one of my gifts. I didn't understand it as a little boy, but people, young people especially, used to just sit down. If I'm sitting on the bench. They would just sit down next to me. Drunk people. To me. And I was like, why is this man? <laughs> like, but, uh, I, I guess I have, the, I have the gift of empathy. And so. It uh, emanates I, from you, Charles. I, 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 you know, I guess I was always like an old spirit. Old. Uh-huh. I said it emanates from you, Charles. The, the comp- it emanates from you, Charles, the compassionate part of you where people want to sit and listen. So listen, Charles, I want to say thank you for coming on tonight. Um, I, you know, we it, we had a nice, very spirited conversation, went off, went off a little bit. It was fun. It was exciting. <laughs> we got to meet your dog, Boston, and and all of that. So um, that's all right. It's fine. It's fine, Charles. I'm going to close, though. I want to say, you know, oh, go ahead. I know a lot of folks might have expected me to be serious, serious. I, I, those folks might have wanted me, expected me to be very serious about this topic, but I like to keep it, you know, we, we have so much stress, especially nowadays at the end, especially going to, you know, closing out the year. We got a lot of stress. And, you know, a lot of times people don't want to deal with this black stuff because it just makes either it raises their stress level because it's you know they start thinking about the issues in the community and their personal traumas and all that so i wanted to make it you know i want I, i'm a, I, you know i'm a jokester I, I wanted to make it so that people didn't you know people want to talk about the subject people want to get engaged in the conversation that young people want to get into it because you know we make it so we sometimes we keep it so high brow high level that young people is like you know they, they can't, they, you know, they can't get into it. They don't want to get into it. You know, so, so I wanted to talk in a way that people will understand that all of these, you know, quote, unquote, black leaders or whatever, they're, I'm, they're people too. I'm, I'm a person too. You know, we, we try, you know, a lot of times people don't want to get involved, especially because, you know, uh, the black stuff, you know, like they think of the nation of Islam, oh, I can't get into that. I can't smoke, I can't drink or whatever. Now, I appreciate them, but I can't really do that. They, you know, it's a similar when you think about pan Africanism and these things, that, like these high ideas that people really can't see how they apply to their lives. And they, you know, like people put Malcolm on a pedestal. Well, Malcolm was the ordinary brother, father. You know, he had flaws, he had greatness. You know, we have to see, we have to present this thing that young so that young people will want to pick it up that's and, right and we they, do they don't think they don't feel like they have to be super people in order to be able to do that super people you know, that's, that's people good. Ordinary human being. and it's important for our young people to do it because the young people are going to carry the uh, torch I, forward I had a couple of laughs in this conversation we um, did we we got a lot of laughs in the conversation right. I, and I hope you all got a laugh i hope i hope you all And I hope you all realize that you have the potential to make this happen within you. That's you right. This is very tangible. Our ancestors are in you. We come from you we come from greatness. Right. And our ancestors are with us. So don't and we can do this. Your ancestors and find out find out who your ancestors were. Find out your family stories. And you go when you find out what your family has done and accomplished in the face of the adversity that's been presented against, you will be able to hold yourself up, your, your head up a little higher, family. I'm telling you when, you, when you start digging into your your family and this research and this information. So, so I just want to uh, say that I um. Somebody cash at me. Okay, I wasn't expecting that, but thank you. <laughs> somebody cashed after them. Listen, 
Uh, Brother Charles, thank you so much for being on. And we we went we went over two hours. So we are seeing the manifestation. I'm about to call you Baby J, Baby Doctor J, because <laughs> you go because we we gotta go. <laughs> So listen. So wait. Let me just say this, Charles. Let me say this. We got the light version because we had serious technical difficulties before we started, and we had I had um, tabs up because he was going to do a presentation. When we figure out the technical difficulties, I'll have him back, uh, fixing them rather. I'll have him back on, and then you can get the full presentation. But for right now, you have his contact information. You got his email. You got his phone number. Y'all can hit the brother up with Cash App because he already got some money. And I just want to say thank you so much for, for coming on today and hanging in there with us. Um, uh, uh, brother Charles is an amazing person. He's so very kind and very giving. And... Um, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. And we're going to have him back on the show. But for now, I just want to say Shem and Matev. This is our last Tuesday talk for 2021. I want to say thank you so much for, for, for being on when we have our show and, and giving your input. And because this is really for the people. And remember, the focus for this year was to leave you with something that is tangible so that you, when you, you can immediately, immediately do something to further um, our Black liberation. OK, and, and for us getting in, into our spirituality and our pan-African minds back so we can take back what is rightfully ours and, and put the parents back in control of humanity. OK, and with that, I bid you a farewell. Shemem Atep, which means go forth in peace. Shemem Aat, which means go forth in balance. Ankh Ujasin Neb, life, prosperity and health. Peace to the brothers and sisters. Peace to the family.